So before we focus on what's right and wrong, we need to start, especially in this day and age, spreading love and respect to one another, right? Because it really breaks the heart of the Muslim that when it comes to discussing the matters pertaining to the birth of the Prophet ﷺ, in his name, we start to argue. In his name, we start to be abusive. In his name, we start to disrespect each other and abuse one another in such a foul way that if the Prophet ﷺ was to see us today, he would have never approved of this. The Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, he was a man of love, a man of unity, and he brought the hearts of the Muslims together. Remember everything about the blessed life of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ has been documented. The way he wept, the way he talked, the way he stepped, the way he walked, the way he conducted himself, the way he spoke to the elite of the Quraysh, the way he addressed the orphans. Uh, as dear brothers and viewers online, we start off by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sending peace and blessings upon the last and final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Last week we, dis uh, we, we discussed two very significant events that took place uh, before the coming of the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, and these were the rediscovery of the wall of Zamzam and we also talked a little bit about the army of Abraha, the army of the elephants uh, which came to destroy the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we mentioned that these uh, two significant events which took place were signs of the coming of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we mentioned in previous sessions that the well of Zamzam was an answer to the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam and it was given as a gift to the family of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So the well of Zamzam is synonymous with Tawheed and this was a sign that Tawheed is going to be revived in Arabia. And also when we look at um, the invasion of the elephants, the army of the elephants which came to attack Baytullah, um, we learn from this that the status quo of Makkah was about to change, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now is telling the people that the status quo of Makkah is going to change, there's no need for any external influence, Tawheed is going to be revived and Makkah and Arabia is going to be cleansed of all the idolatry and the idol worship within the area. Um, before we talk about the birth of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, um, there's a question that arises uh, and this is why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose Arabia for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to come as the last and final messenger and the seal of the prophets. Uh, this was a place, a desert land, which was uh, referred to as backward, being a, a Bedouin nation. So why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not choose, for example, uh, the Roman Empire, which was one of the mightiest civilizations at the time, or the Persian Empire? which was one of the ancient civilizations at the time. Um, and the scholars, they've got various reasons. Uh, Allah, in his wisdom, uh, he sent the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa as an answer to the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And we'll come to this in a, in a few minutes. Uh, but firstly, the Arabs and Arabia uh, were right in between the two major superpowers of the time. Uh, this was the Roman su uh, superpower known as the Byzantine and the Persian superpower. Uh, this uh, Sassanids. So Arabia connected two of these greatest superpowers at the time. And we mentioned, we talked about the political, social, uh, e economical um, uh, environment at the time. And we mentioned that one of the most remarkable features uh, of the political landscape of Arabia at the time uh, was the total absence of any political organization. We mentioned a couple of weeks ago that uh, the great 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 grandfather of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he he w introduced the Darul Nadwa, which was uh, the the house where the people gathered and they voiced their opinions. But this wasn't when we compare it to today's day and age, it wasn't a uh, government which was formed 
and there's, there's um, a voting process and there's democracy. Rather, uh, the, the chieftains uh, of the tribes at the time, they were given the authority and the respect from the people. So, for example, if there's 10 tribes in Arabia at the time, there were 10 chieftains. And the people in their respective tribes, they didn't think of anybody else as an authority apart from their chieftains. And as a result of this, um, there wasn't any colonial influence. So the Arabs, they were busy fighting each other. We talked about the internal warfare that people had for hundreds and thousands of years. There was no unified government and there was a lack of law and order. So when there's a lack of law and order, people take things into their own hands. And it, for example, in the event a crime was committed, uh, the injured party would take the law into its own hands and try to administer justice to the offender. So there's narrations that mention that it was an, a backward state. Um, why was it, uh, why did Allah subhanahu wa choose this place? And some of the scholars, they also mention that nobody, because of these reasons that we just discussed, nobody could have predicted that there would have been a political uprising, a political force coming from Arabia. Uh, it's as if someone points to one third in today's day and age. It's as if somebody highlights a third world country and says in the next five years, this third world country is going to be one of the greatest superpowers of the world. So today we have America, we have UK, we have Russia, we have China. So imagine if somebody was to point out a third world country and say this is going to be the next superpower in the next three to five years. How would we feel at the time? So when the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire, they looked at these people, they used to laugh at them. Uh, it's mentioned that some of the emperors at the time, when uh, under the command of Umar ibn al-Khattab, the Arabs, they were marching towards the palaces of Rome and Persia. Some of the emperors at the time, they were actually making a joke of this, that really these people from the desert, they're going to come and they're going to march against us. And they took it as a joke. They used to say things like, you know, here's some gold coins, take them and, and go away. Because they didn't really take this, uh, the Arabs seriously. So, and we see under the um, leadership of Umar ibn al-Khattab, um, Arabia conquered these two great superpowers of the time. So, as Muslims, we also believe that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and the previous prophets, another, re another reason, is that they were sent, the previous prophets, they were sent for previous nations. But the Prophet sallallahu was sent as a universal prophet, meaning he was the last and the final prophet. So it was only befitting that his place be the first house of worship which was built on this earth. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions in the Quran, إِنَّ أَوَّلَ بَيْتِ وُذِعَ لِلنَّاسِ لَلَّذِي بِبَكَّةَ مُبَارَكَ وَهُدًا لِلْعَالَمِينَ That indeed the first house of worship established for man mankind was that at Mecca, blessed and a guidance for the world. So this was again a sign of the coming of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And when we look into the lifestyle of the Arabs, they were very simple people. Now there's positives and negatives of being simple in nature. One of the positives is that when truth comes, you're more receptive because you don't have background baggage. So we see the Roman civilization, the Persian civilization, they had infrastructure, they had uh, a political landscape, they had armies, they had law and order. So there's all of this baggage that comes with it. But we had the Arabs who lived a very peaceful lifestyle, a simple lifestyle. So this was also uh, a readiness for the coming of the Prophet Wasallam that when Islam was going to come with its Sharia and the Prophet Wasallam was going to bring and build the foundations of Islam, it was going to be easily uh, acceptable by the people. And the, the Arabs, they were used to hardship. We mentioned at the time that when they used to travel in the desert, sometimes the journeys could be months and months long. So they were used to this. And Islam at the time needed the stamina that neither the Persian or the Roman Empire could provide at the time. What do I mean by this? So when you have a civilization, there's certain quality levels that are expected. So we see the, the Roman Empire, right? They had army ranks, they had army generals. There's, there's, there's a certain requirement required for the army to march into battle. 
they need good equipment, they need good armor, they need numbers of people. But because the Arabs, they were used to the hardship of the time, this is the stamina that was required. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through his wisdom, he chose a group that he knew would be able to benefit Islam in its early days. And we mentioned some of the great characteristics uh, of the, um, it'll go off inshallah. Uh, we mentioned that some of the great characteristics of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, sorry, not the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, of, of the people at the time, uh, was their bravery. Uh, they were very honest people. So whenever they used to uh, talk in society, they used to be honest. They hated lying. Whenever they promised something, whenever they made an oath, they were people who wanted to fulfill their oath. So these are some of the good qualities that they had in their community at the time. And finally, um, uh, penultimate reason, um, the Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned that the Arabian horses are the best horses and the uh, Arabian riders are also the, the best riders. So this is uh, in a hadith of Prophet ﷺ, he talks about the Arabian horses being horses which are very sought after. So this was again something which was very good for their military warfare. But the final and the most uh, compelling reason is the answer of uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam's dua. Uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, he mentions in a hadith, وَأَنَا دَعْوَةُ أَبِي Ibrahim. I am the response of the dua of Ibrahim, my father. وَأَنَا بُشْرَى Isa ibn Maryam. And I am the glad tidings that Isa alayhi salam predicted. So we know the verse of the Quran. رَبَّنَا وَبْعَثْ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ يَتْلُوَ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِكَ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابُ وَالْحِكْمَةُ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْعَزِيزُ Hakim. When Ibrahim alayhi salam, he's building the house of Allah with his son Ismail alayhi salam. At the same time, he's doing a good deed and he's making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is, O oh Allah, send amongst them a messenger from themselves who will recite to them the verses and teach them the book and wisdom and purify them. Indeed, you that are the exalted in might and the wise. So the Prophet وسلم, he mentions that his coming is an answer to the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So this is some of the um, reasons for why uh, the scholars they mention that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he sent the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam to Arabia. Um, there are other reasons, uh, but these are some of the most compelling reasons. Uh, now we're going to discuss the family of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So a couple of weeks ago, we discussed the lineage of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and we discussed the immediate parents of the Prophet ﷺ, which were Abdullah and Amina. And we mentioned that Abdullah and Amina, uh, they had very good qualities. They were very handsome and beautiful. And the qualities that Abdullah had were reflected in Amina at the time. They were a young couple. They got married. And just within a week, some of the narrations mentioned three days, three, day, three to five days, uh, Abdullah was sent on a uh, journey, on a business trip uh, by his, uh, his father, uh, Abdul Muttalib, and he had to leave Mecca at the time. So some of the scholars, they say that this was a very, very short time after, after uh, um, marriage, that Abdullah had to leave Mecca. Some of the narrations, they mentioned that he had to go to Syria, and some of the narrations, they mentioned that he went to Yathrib on a business trip. Uh, however, unfortunately, he got ill, and during this time when the caravan was going to return, he stayed in Yathrib at the time. We know that he has relatives in Yathrib because the um, grandmother, his grandmother was from uh, Yathrib at the time. When we, when we mentioned um, Ibn Hisham, um, Abu Hashim, his wife was from Medina at the time. So he had relatives in Medina and because he was ill, they were taking care of him uh, during this time. Now, after some time, the news reaches Mecca that Abdullah is no more. He has passed away and his soul has returned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, during this time, Amina, she is expecting the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And now we're going to move on to uh, the, the, the date, the time when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was born. Now, the birth date of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is very widely contested amongst the scholars. There's no consensus uh, regarding the date in which the Prophet Muhammad was born. We have a year, 
which was known as uh, Amul Fin, which was the year of the elephants. And many majority of the scholars, they mention that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was born within a period of two months after the um, uh, uh, army of the elephants were was going to atta attack the Kaaba. Uh, your phone is distracting me. <laughs> Can you put it on uh, aeroplane? You can't put it on aeroplane now. Okay, fine. Um, so, 50 to 55 days, right? Um, uh, after the army of Abraha was going to attack uh, Baytullah. So this was known as the year of the elephant. We mentioned on various occasions that the Arabs, they didn't have a calendar system. So they marked significant events which took place by something significant that, that took place in the year. So this was a significant event that took place, which was the time when Abraha and his army were coming to attack the Kaaba. So this was known as the year of the elephants. Um, we have a day on which the Prophet ﷺ was born. There's a hadith in Sahih Muslim where Abu Qatada uh, reported that the Prophet ﷺ was asked about fasting on Mondays. And he said, this is the day on which I was born and the day on which I received revelation. So this is the day in which the Prophet ﷺ was born and he received revelation through Jibreel, Jibreel ﷺ. So we have the year, Amul Fil, and we have uh, the day in which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born. Now, how about the, the month? Sorry, not the month. Yes, the, the month and the date. So the month, again, ma majority of the scholars, they say uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born in Rabi al Uh There are some other narrations which state um, Ramadan and some other months. But the majority of the scholars, uh, they agree on that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born in Rabi al Awal. Now, how about the date? This is where it gets even more in interesting. We have two of the earliest books of Sirah. We mentioned that the earliest book of Sirah is Ibn Ishaq, right? He died 150 Hijrah. So imagine the, the calendar starts when the Prophet Sallallahu migrated to Medina. So 150 years after the Prophet Sallallahu migrated to Medina, this is when Ibn Ishaq passes away. But for in order for Ibn Ishaq to write about the birth date of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he has to go back to 53 years before the migration. Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam received his prophethood at 40, and then he was in Mecca for a period of 13 years, which made it 53. And then the final 10 years of his life, he spent in Medina. So now this is going back 200 years. So Ibn Ishaq, he writes in his Sirah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born on Monday, the 12th of Rabi al-Awwal, in the year of the elephants. And this is without any isnad, without any chain of narrators. So we don't know uh, how he got this information. It's just it's Ibn Ishaq in his book writing this. Then we go to another source, which is the Tabaqat of Ibn Sa'ad. And this his book of Sirah was written 220 years after the Hijrah. And he says that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born on a Monday. Some people, and I quote, some people say he was born on the 10th of Rabi al Awal. Others say he was born on the 2nd of Rabi al Awal. So how many dates do we have now? We have the 12th of Rabi al Awal, the 10th of Rabi al Awal, and the 2nd of Rabi al Awal. Ibn Abbas, he mentions the, the 10th of Rabi al Awal, and Ibn Kathir, in his book, al Bidaya wa Nihaya, he says the majority opinion is that the Prophet ﷺ was born in Rabi al Awal, but others have other months as well. The scholars differed as to the date of his birth. And then he talks about the difference of opinions. So he says one group mentions the second of Rabi al Awal. And there were some great scholars from Andalus, uh, Ibn, Ibn al Abdul Bar. Al-Waqidi, these were some of the famous historians of the time. So their opinion was that the Prophet ﷺ was born on the second of Rabi al-Awwal. Another opinion is that the Prophet ﷺ was born on the eighth of Rabi al-Awwal. Ibn Hazm, again from Andalus, Imam Malik, Rahimahullah, uh, Az-Zuhri. So these scholars, they mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ was born on the eighth of Rabi al-Awwal. And then we have a third opinion. The 10th of Rabi al-Awwal. This is according to Ibn Kathir. Then we have a fourth opinion. The 12th of Rabi al-Awwal. 
And then we have the ninth of Rabi'ul Awwal. Again, a lot of evidence for the Prophet ﷺ being born on the ninth of Rabi'ul Awwal. One of the stronger opinions. And then we have the 17th of Rabi'ul Awwal. And we have the 22nd of Rabi'ul Awwal. Uh, as also as opinions. Um, so we see here now quite a lot of difference of opinion on when the Prophet ﷺ was born. And it's, it's a coincidence actually that we're discussing the birth of the Prophet ﷺ in the first week of Rabi al Awwal. Right? This is a month in which all the debates, they start to take place. So the month of Rabi al Awwal is the month in which people start to come out and they start to debate about the birthday of the Prophet ﷺ. Is it an innovation to celebrate it? Is it an act of worship to celebrate the birth of the Prophet ﷺ? And I, I just want to focus on this for the uh, remaining part of the session. Um, every time uh, or, or commonly uh, we hear uh, the verses of the Quran recited in the khutbah and we also recite the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam which is recited in the khutbah. Uh, one of the common uh, hadith which is recited is Inna asdaq al-hadithi kitabullah wa ahsan al-hadiyya hadiyu Muhammadin Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wa sharul umuri muhdathatiha wa kullu muhdathatin bid'a wa kullu bid'atin dhalala wa kullu dhalalatin finnar and this is translated as indeed the most truthful form of speech is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is the book of Allah the best source of guidance is the guidance which was brought by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the worst of all affairs is the innovations in religion there's a hadith in Tirmidhi uh, which mentions every newly invented matter is a bid'ah, is an innovation. And every bid'ah is a dalala, which is going astray from the straight path. And every dalala is in the fire. So what is this issue of innovation? Right? Because there's a lot of people that ask this question. What is innovation? What is bid'ah? Right? Is what we're doing correct? Is it authentic? Is it sahih? Or is it an innovation? Now, innovation is basically a person feels that they know better than the Prophet ﷺ. In layman's term, if this is the way we can explain it, right? Because the Prophet ﷺ, he was sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a role model to humanity. Because if he was to be sent by an angel, the people would have com complained that this person is not a human being. Rather, the, he's an immortal. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he sent the Prophet ﷺ as a human being, as an example to humanity. And the Prophet ﷺ, during his lifetime, he showed us how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was sent as a living example, right, to teach us how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I usually give examples of uh, a family buying a carpet from the, the carpet shop. You go into the carpet shop, you choose the carpet, and you go on to the counter, you're about to pay the money. The owner of the shop says, today I've got a special offer. You've bought the carpet, I'm going to give you free delivery and free installation. What is a person going to think? If you buy a TV from the shop and somebody says, I'm going to give you free installation. You'll be overjoyed, right? Because this person or, the, or this organization is sending groups of people, right? Who are experts in this field. So when a person comes and fits a carpet in your house and you try to fit the carpet in your house, who's going to do the job better? That person who is the carpet fitter because they're doing this on a daily basis. They are trained in it. They have the experience. So similarly, you would say this is an excellent customer service, right? So the sending of the Prophet Sallallahu by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is an excellent customer service, right? Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has sent his Prophet, to show us how to worship him. And the Prophet ﷺ, he didn't leave any stone unturned, right? So if anybody comes up with an act of worship after the Prophet ﷺ, this is in fact going away from the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ. And the month of Rabi al-Awwal is a month in which Muslims, they come together and they debate on this one topic. What is love? for the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Does it mean celebrating his birthday? Does it mean refraining from celebrating his birthday? And there's two groups, right? Usually there's two groups. And these two groups, what first are those who claim 
to celebrate the birthday of the Prophet ﷺ out of love, out of veneration for him. But then also the opposite is true. And then on the other hand, we have another group who don't celebrate the birthday of the Prophet ﷺ out of love for him. Right? So we have two groups. One celebrating because they love the Prophet ﷺ, one not celebrating because they love the Prophet ﷺ. Which one is correct? So before we focus on what's right and wrong, we need to start, especially in this day and age, spreading love and respect to one another, right? Because it really breaks the heart of the Muslim that when it comes to discussing the matters pertaining to the birth of the Prophet ﷺ, in his name, we start to argue. In his name, we start to be abusive. In his name, we start to disrespect each other and abuse one another in such a foul way that if the Prophet ﷺ was to see us today, he would have never approved of this. Because we disagree, because there's a difference of opinion on this matter, we start to abuse our fellow Muslim brothers and sisters. This is completely wrong. The Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, he was a man of love, a man of unity, and he brought the hearts of the Muslims together. Such a beautiful example of what the Prophet ﷺ did when the migration took place. When, when the Muhajirun of Mecca, they came and they were settling in Medina. How the Prophet ﷺ built the bonds of brotherhood. This is to true brotherhood in Islam. So, we are living in times where our Ummah is facing many external challenges. So the first thing that we as a Muslim Ummah have to do is we have to unite upon the banner of Islam. We need to clear our minds, we need to clear our hearts and remove any emotions uh, uh, attached to this subject. Right? Especially when it's connected to social norms and social habits. Something that which is part of our culture. But many people, they get emotionally uh, charged. And they start doing things without thinking. So they get emotionally charged. This is why they say even in the workplace. One of the qualities of, of, of being a good candidate in the workplace sometimes is emotional resilience. They ask you on the application form. Can you give us an example of emotional resilience? Meaning that when it comes to making a decision or doing a task in the workplace, if there's any external factors that are about to impact, have an impact, how do you respond in that situation? Are you emotionally attached? Something took place and you changed your decision without looking at all the evidence that was there on the table. So if you have strong emotional resilience, you have a strong sense of mind. So, I want to break this down to uh, four very simple questions, right? The first is, do we know when the Prophet ﷺ was born? The second, do we know when the Prophet ﷺ passed away? Uh, is there any evidence that the birthday of the Prophet ﷺ was celebrated during his time and the companions? And if not, who started the celebration of the birthday of the Prophet ﷺ? So the first two questions are very easy to answer. We mentioned the first answer in a lot of detail, right? There's no consensus amongst the scholars uh, about the birth day of the Prophet ﷺ. There's a difference of opinion. So then we move on to the uh, date on which the Prophet ﷺ passed away. Now there is a, and this is an alarming fact, there is a consensus from amongst all of the scholars that the Prophet ﷺ, he died on the 12th of Rabi al Awal. So when people, they celebrate the birthday of the Prophet ﷺ, which is the most common date that they celebrate it? The 12th of Rabi al Awal, which they think is the day in which the Prophet ﷺ was born. However, it's confirmed that actually the Prophet ﷺ died. He passed away on this day. Okay, so this leads us to our next question. Did the Prophet ﷺ or any of his companions celebrate his birthday? And for any act of worship, in Islam, right? We have to provide evidence for it. So if we if we think that this act of celebrating the birthday of the Prophet ﷺ is showing our love, is showing our veneration for the Prophet ﷺ, we need to turn to the Quran and the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ and we need to provide evidence for it. Simply, as the Prophet ﷺ showed us through his hadith, right? When you pray the five daily prayers, if somebody wanted to pray Maghrib, and says, I want to be a special person. 
I want to love, I want to show my love and veneration to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more on today. I'm going to pray four units of Maghrib instead of three. Will it be accepted? It won't be accepted. Why? Because the Prophet وسلم, informed us that Maghrib consists of three rakah. If you pray four, it's not valid. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his Prophet, he showed us how to worship him. So similarly, we go into the Quran, we go into the Hadith. There is no chain back to the Prophet وسلم, this is a very compelling evidence. There is no chain back to the Prophet وسلم, even weak or let's go further, even fabricated that you can trace back to the Prophet وسلم, to the era of the companions, right? The first, second and third of the best generations to the f four schools of thought. There's no hadith which is weak or fabricated that talks about the celebration of the Prophet's birthday. Have we ever heard Abu Bakr radiallahu an, Umar radiallahu an, Uthman radiallahu an, Ali radiallahu an, celebrating the birthday of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Right? They were, these were the pioneers of the Ummah of the time. They were so busy. They didn't find his birthday and we found his birthday. Does it make sense? Right? They didn't find time to celebrate his birthday and we found time to celebrate his birthday. So how come, if, if this is such a compelling fact, how come we don't find one single hadith in which the Prophet wasallam said, don't forget to celebrate my birthday. Remember everything about the blessed life of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam has been documented. The way he wept, the way he talked, the way he slept, the way he walked, the way he conducted himself, the way he spoke to the elite of the Quraysh, the way he addressed the orphans. But we don't find one single hadith on this topic. Do we love the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, more than this generation of the companions? And we mentioned many times that the main difference between us and the Sahaba was they followed a Sunnah, they implemented a Sunnah because it was a Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم. Love meant following the way of the Prophet وسلم. Today we claim to love. It's very easy to like a, 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 a nice message, a hadith of the Prophet وسلم. How about implementing it through our action, through our character? So the Prophet companions, they knew how to show love and obey the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now this uh, leads us on to our final question. Who started the celebration of the birthday of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? And historically, when did it start? So the first record we have in history, right, of anyone celebrating the birthday of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was around 517 Hijra, 517 years after the migration of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the sixth century of Islam, right? So for the first 500 years, there's no evidence, there's nothing to suggest that the birthday of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was uh, uh, celebrated. So the first group to celebrate. Uh, the Mawlid, was the Fatimids of Egypt, who are not of Sunni theology. And they said that this is out of love, out of veneration for the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. A group of people, they came together and they said, we are going to celebrate this as love, as a sign of love for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Look at the verse of the Quran. There was a group of people who came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they said, O Prophet, we love Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed a verse to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and this was known as Ayatul Imtihan. قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِ يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهُ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ Say, O oh Muhammad, to these people, if you really love Allah, then follow me. Allah will love you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive you your sins. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is forgiving and merciful. What was the instruction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? If you love Allah, then follow me. Meaning, follow the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So, love is to adhere to the teachings of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and we'll be asked about this when we leave this world, when we enter the grave, right? Two angels will come, and they will ask us three questions: Who is your Rabb? What is your Deen? And who is this person? The scholars they mention, just because you knew the name of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, on in that time, when you're in the grave, you're not going to be able to answer straight away. It's the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa You won't have a voice at that time. But if you loved 
his sunnah, if you implemented his sunnah, if you acted upon his sunnah, you will be able to answer these questions easily. easily. So, the successful one is he who believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and who believes in the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and implements them through action. Usually, when we try and stop people, when they are doing these practices of innovating, innovating is basically, basically the act of in inventing something new in the religion. So somebody invents something, an act of worship, into the religion, and there's no evidence in the seerah, there's no evidence in the hadith, there's no evidence in the Quran for this. There's no basis for this. So people invent this matter, and they think it's a sign of coming closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What did the pagans do at the time? وَلَئِنْ سَأَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَسَخَّرَ الشَّمْسَ وَالْقَبَرَ لَيَقُولُ إِنَّ اللَّهِ فَأَنَّا يُؤْفَكُونَ Right? They believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you ask them who created the heavens and the earth and subjected the sun and the moon, they would surely say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So why were they worshipping idols? Because they created this mindset that these idols are going to make us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they invented something into the religion. It was an innovation. They diluted the Tawheed of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So similarly, when somebody invents something new, and over many, many years, it becomes a custom, it becomes part of the culture, and then we have some of the young generation we see today, they come and they tell their forefathers, Father, stop doing this. Mom, don't go to this place. This is an innovation taking place. Automatically, debates start taking place in the house, and there's arguments. Son, you're telling me, I've been doing this for the past 20 years. Why are these people getting angry? Because they feel that they're doing something which is going to bring them closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a great example of this is when somebody passes away, right? People, they gather on the seventh night, on the 10th night, on the 40th night. And they gather, they do some prayers. But again, this wasn't part of the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Three things are going to benefit a person. Of those is the dua of a child for his parents. Some charity which was left behind. Some beneficial knowledge which was left behind. So now when you come and tell these people that this is not part of the sunnah, they're telling you to go away. We're doing something good. We're saying the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you're telling us this is not part of the religion? Be off. So we, we need to be very careful. Because sometimes what happens is in our emotion, we think we're doing something to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and rather we are we are on the wrong track. And this is in a verse of the Quran, uh, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qul hal bil sa'yuhum fil hayat dunya wa hum annahum suna. Say Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, shall we believers inform you of the greatest losers uh, as to their deeds. So here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling, informing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that who are the greatest losers? They are those whose efforts uh, is lost in worldly life while they think they are doing good work. So they think in their mind, we're worshipping Allah, we're doing something good. Rather, all of their efforts are in vain. So we need to be careful that whenever we do anything, it has to be according to the Quran, the Sunnah of the Prophet Never ever think that there is a single act of worship that the Prophet Muhammad forgot to teach us. Never ever think that there's any act of worship that you may engage in, which is better than what the Prophet taught us. We know the hadith in which some companions, they came to inquire about the Prophet routine. They asked his wife, Aisha radiallahu anha at the time, what is the routine of the Prophet And she said, he does this, he does this, he does this. After that, what did they say? One person said, I'm not going to get married. Another person said, I'm going to be worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all the time. And I'm going to fast. Right? They came up with these things. The Prophet sallallahu when he heard about this, what did he say? I fast and I stop fasting. And I marry w women. Right? Meaning this is part of your life. And me as a messenger sallallahu alayhi wa I am the best amongst all of you. And he didn't say this out of pride. But he was showing them that you have to follow me. 
because I have been sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is true success. Success lies in following the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So uh, inshallah, uh, we'll end on this. Um, and I want to end with the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where he says, he who loves my sunnah loves me, and he who loves me will be with me in Jannah. And the scholars, they mention that when uh, a person loves the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it just doesn't mean you have that love from your heart. Rather, you implement it uh, throughout your life. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the ability to act in accordance with the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and give us the ability to act upon what has been said. Wa akhir da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.